All right, here we go. Back to riding the e-bike. Uh, this time of day sucks because of all the traffic. residential street but people treat it like it's a state highway let's see oh no this is the wrong way okay so January 19th, 2021. I'm going to get turned around up here. I was going to try to do a shortcut onto the golf course. Got my bike out of the shop. Got it working good again. This is a Himalay fat tire mountain bike. 26 by 4 inch tires and uh, it's also an electric power assist which you can do varying degrees of power assist and it also has 7 gears Shimano gears so you kind of find a balance of uh, to where you're not doing what I call ghost peddling Ghost pedaling is when you're pedaling, but you're really, you know, you're not doing anything. So I try to make it to where I'm pedaling, but I'm not, uh, you know, having to pedal too hard. It's a, it's a great bike. Um, you know, e-bikes are one of those things that you can spend as much money as you want to. You can spend 10000 or more. How you doing? How are you? Very good. And uh, I find that, um, you know, the $10,000 ones are really fast, right? And um, I personally, I don't need to go 50 miles an hour on a bike, on a scooter. I'm not into all that. I go about 20, 22 on this. And, that feels really fast to me. Um, you can hack this one to go up to 30, but I, I mean, I just, I just don't have the need. You know, I ride on residential streets and golf courses and stuff, and I just, I don't need all that blinding speed. Trust me, 22, 2022 is fast enough to get away from any problem you might have. Alright, so they updated the wood on this bridge. That's good. Because it was getting pretty raggedy. Made it a better experience for sure. I'll show you. Uh, this is, um, I love this fountain. At Christmas time, these houses do a really big show too. But I just love this fountain. Uh, that's one of my guys that uh, probably wanted to place a bet. Let me see what he's got going on. that I'll check it soon okay so big day leading up to the inauguration yeah all the debate about whether you like Trump or whether you like Biden I can tell you this I do not buy into this whole thing about you know 
all the violence and all that. I don't, I don't think that, uh, I think they're being dramatic, trying to make Trump look bad. Trump's not perfect. He screws up on the regular, but I don't believe all this high drama crap they're trying to put on him. Um, however, they're just let Biden in, man. Trump said he's going to turn things over. It's all going to be peaceful. Let Biden in. Let him do his thing. Uh, Y'all know why I'm saying that. Because I used the hashtag Bitcoin in this video. Right? And I'm telling you, I, I mean, it's not just my idea. Everybody thinks that all this money printing is going to lead to inflated prices for Bitcoin. And, um, you know, I think they're right. It may not be as dramatic as they think. But, you know, we're still trying to pay back the money we printed in 2008 when, you know, the too big to fail super bailouts because all the bankers needed, uh, the executives needed bonuses, right? So we, we bailed them out and they, they you know, because they, they, the poor guys, they almost didn't get their bonus back in 2008, but we, we saved them. We saved them and they got their bonus. And we're still trying to pay that back. And COVID hit. Right, we're—I mean—we're trying to pay that back, and and things were tough before COVID. And Trump was doing some good things to turn the economy around, but you know it's tough. It's tough to pay back that much debt. And uh, well, I need to be mindful of my battery there. I'm down one bar. Um, I didn't charge it last night, so I won't—I won't go 20 miles today. <laughs> um, so there's you know been stimulus packages, COVID slowed down our economy, a lot of people are out of work, so we got less income, more outcome, and uh, you know it's been tough. It's it's been really tough, and now there's another stimulus package, <clears throat> and there's going to be more to come. Biden's going to you know Biden's going to have to spend a lot of money. And Democrats are in, in control of, the, of Congress now, you know, the House and the Senate. So there's not going to be a lot of opposition. There, there'll be some. We still got Republicans in there. They still got to, you know, put in thoughtful legislation that everybody can get behind. But look, it's just going to be easier for them now. And all that equals them having to print more money. All of that equals that at the end of the day. And so. We're going to have to print more money, which means we're up in our debt load, which means inflation, right? Because if, if, you know, these, if the amount of dollars out there have increased like they said, like the M2 money supply, like 35% of all the money that is in circulation was printed in the last year you know if that's so then um, you know that's basically debt and if you bought something for a hundred thousand dollars before we printed 35 percent of a money supply then what do you think it's worth after we've printed 35 percent it's worth less now we may not realize that because you know, we're here in America, and we're in this bubble, and, uh, but we do start to realize it in inflation, because there's, as costs come up, and I don't mean that, you know, printing money is, you know, just always a terrible thing, I think maybe in a controlled fashion, uh, there's rhyme or reason to it, is all I'll say, uh, but it's probably never absolutely healthy, you know, and so, uh, if, if we've already printed this much money, well, what we've got coming in, in this year, 21, is going to be ridiculous. The amount of money we're going to have to print to keep up with things. Excuse me. I always scare people on this big old bike. And so uh, we're going to have to print more money. So I bet we go to like... I don't know. We're going to print a couple trillion dollars. 
but I think it's going to be higher. I think by the time 21 is closed out, we're going to have printed like $5 trillion, which, um, let's face it, we're in new territory, man. We don't know what that's going to do to our economy, because never before on the face of Earth has an economy that been this big and this powerful and then start printing this much money. But we do know this. The civilizations, the municipal organizations that have existed down through the dawn of time have always, you know, started and built up and got big and went away. There's one thing that precipitates the decline of the nations, and it's printing money. It's weakening the money supply. You know, like, uh, you know, Rome did it, and the Greeks did it, everybody's dying. If, if, if you know anything about coin collecting and all that, you know, like the early Roman coins were made out of gold and silver, and, um, and you know, they had a value, they, they had a worth, and, uh, and it was, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the dog was going to get me, and, uh, so these coins represented the nation's wealth, right, like it was issued by the government, it was gold that they had, and dispersed amongst the population, oh, I meant to go up there, I'll go up here and turn around. And um, that gold was to, you know, be used in commerce and then eventually make its way back to the government during tightening or, or loosening exercises. Uh, I'm sure the treasuries then, you know, had that concept down on some level. And so um, at some point, they ran out of gold that they could issue more currency with. So guess what they did? They... They had people, they confiscated, they had people turn their gold coins back in, gold and silver, and they mixed it with like copper, right? So like the very early Roman coins, if you were to find a very early Roman coin, you're actually going to find, um, you know, something that's got, got value. But if you find the later ones, they have been... Um, diluted with tin, copper and stuff like that and tin and uh, and so the coin itself got lighter like you I mean you just pick them up and you can tell and at the last days of the Roman Empire they were they had cut them so much that they were you know they're very very light compared to the early ones and uh, they just started to lose their value and uh, they, they lost their value and they and and it took more and more of them to pay for stuff. That's inflation. Same thing happened with the Greeks. It's just every every nation like that's happening and now, and now we're doing it. And it, you know we've got some modern examples of it. You know, it's happening in some African countries. It's happening in like Zimbabwe and stuff like that. Venezuela, where um, they just kept printing money and printing money to you know pay for things. And whoops, you run out of money. You know, the inflation gets so bad that you have to bring a whole truckload of the currency, bricks and bricks and bricks of it, just to pay for, you know, a shopping cart full of groceries or something. And so, um, hello, that level of inflation, um, my whole point is you get to this point where you cannot pay it back. It's kind of like us as consumers. You know, like we, everybody has some debt, some credit card debt, whatever. You know, I know a lot of people are getting better at paying it down. But, um, hello. But everybody has some. And But if you get too much, what happens? You, you can't ever catch up. Just your, just your stand and still payments, you know, like the payments you have to make just to maintain is everything you can do right and one thing comes up and you're screwed like if you you know you got to put a transmission in your car or something 
you, you can't do it. You can't afford it. And so, um, so it happens to nations too. You know, people go bankrupt. Well, nations go bankrupt. And so, we don't know what it's gonna, what's going to happen when a country like America goes bankrupt, so to speak. I'm not saying we're absolutely going bankrupt, but we're going to have trouble making our debt payments. So that's going to make it tough on the rest of the world because they're the one that holds our debt. And since our economy is you know, so dependent on these other countries, I can just assume prices are going to go up. And maybe some of that will drive, you know, stateside manufacturing, which we're not ready for. I'm the, you know, I'd love for everything to be made in America, but we, we don't have anybody that knows how to make anything anymore. You know, the few people that understand how to run CNC lays and all that stuff, and they're, they're in high demand. And, um, and it's just going to get uh, worse because we're just, we don't even have the schools for it. And a lot of people don't even encourage their kids to learn how to do stuff like that anymore. You know, we're, we're developing a nation of help desk, IT help desk people, unfortunately, and, uh, and service, you know, waiters and chefs and all, which I mean, they're, that's important roles, and some of those you can make good money at, you probably have more job stability than a guy like me that's an IT project manager coming out of the oil and gas business. Um, so our economy is not ready to do the things that we need to do to pay down that kind of debt that we have right now. But we're about to print a whole lot more. So, so the idea is you can't counterfeit a Bitcoin. You can't, you can't fake it. You can't print any more. You know, I mean, I guess it's possible that something like that, somebody tries it. But so far, nobody's ever been able to do that. And with other cryptos, you know, there have been instances where um, somebody's figured out how to how to duplicate a coin or something. But those coins tend to um, not be as widely held, and they're almost experimental. Hello, and uh, these um, coins like Bitcoin, you know, there's like there's no organization formal organization there's no CEO of it Satoshi Nakamoto we don't know who he is and he he backed out of it anyway I mean for all we know he's dead some people think he might be Elon Musk there's some alignments there with his timeline and his philosophies that uh, are interestingly enough uh, could be he, and he was visionary enough also. Could be. It could be something there. And so, um, but even if it is, like he's, you know, he's he backed out of it. And his coin stash hasn't been touched. And uh, so Bitcoin becomes interesting a little bit. You know, one day when they when you finish mining it, after we're all dead and gone, there'll be 21 million. And we're at, I think we're at 19 million, or we're approaching 19 million already. So, uh, you know, we're on the home stretch, and then there won't be any more. And, you know, it's, uh, we're about to understand what scarcity is, you know. We're already consuming, companies are consuming more Bitcoin than what's being made every day. There's like 900 being made every day, yet we find ourselves, um, find ourselves um, buying up more than that institutional buying and stuff like that and there's uh, I think there's like 40,000 Bitcoin available on exchanges which that sounds like a lot but you know if we're, if we're making 900 a day and, and we're buying 1500 a day or you know if that were to go to a thousand a day I mean if that were to go to like 1900 a day to where we're where we need a thousand a day, you know, we're only talking about thirty or forty days worth of Bitcoin out there. So uh, scarcity could kick in, and you know what happens when people make a buy and there's nothing available, you know, and that's where people start thinking that these astronomical numbers could happen with Bitcoin. 
and <clears throat> you can't counterfeit Bitcoin. You know, there's a lot of people that are critical of Bitcoin, saying that it's used for nefarious reasons, and you, you'll hear them bring up Silk Road and you know all that stuff. But the truth is, you can't counterfeit Bitcoin. And tell me something that um, U.S. dollars have been used for, or you know, the, or tell me something bad that Bitcoin's been used for that U.S. dollars haven't been used for. And there's this myth that the Bitcoin's anonymous and all that. And I think everybody knows now it's not. But in the early days, that, that was a myth. It was like, oh, it's digital money it just disappears. No. Um, you know, every full operating Bitcoin node has like 300 gigs of data with the, the stack that shows every Bitcoin and where it's been and where it's at and who sent it to who. And, and it doesn't take long. I mean, you write down somebody's wallet address and you can figure out, oh, that's so-and-so. And this is so-and-so. Oh, well, so this guy sent this guy $10,000. You know, I'm telling you, man, once, once they know who you are, you know, if they can attach you to your wallet, then they know everything you've done. And uh, so Bitcoin's actually very visible. And for that reason, I think probably some people in the government love it, like the IRS, because they feel great about it. They can, uh, they can track it. They can track it a whole lot better than they can your dollar bills in 20s and 50s and 100s. And you know what? Our money's serialized. Every dollar you got in your wallet has a unique identifier on it. It has a serial number that makes that bill unique that could easily be put on the blockchain. We could easily roll over to a, um, to a digital currency because every dollar that's out there is serialized. And if we had to reconcile that serial number with a central repository, counterfeiting would go out the window. And guess what? If, if you're taking a unique identifier for a certain amount of money and you reconcile it against a common decentralized database that spans, um, you know, different countries and different cities and, and all that, well, I just described Bitcoin to you then. You know, because that's what Bitcoin is. And, um, and I, you know, we don't, we can't track our dollars. My $20, I got a wallet full of $20 bills right now and they're serialized. But the government can't track it. There's no, you know, what they need to do is put an RFID in there. Or you just go to Bitcoin. But, of course, you know, the problems with Bitcoin is, uh, is that um, it costs a lot and it's slow. I mean, when I'm talking about slow, like when I send Bitcoin from one wallet to another, I don't know, it takes like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and it costs a little bit. I personally used to love Ripple, but Ripple is uh, persona non grata in the U.S. right now. And so um, I don't know if I'm ever going to buy Ripple to send it again. But, uh, you know, Ethereum costs a lot, and it's kind of slow. Um, my favorite cryptocurrency, because it's cheap and fast, I don't even need to say it, y'all already know, right? It's Tron. Tron's a beautiful, beautiful, fast blockchain. And if you stake up a little bit for bandwidth and energy, man, my bike's making a lot of noise. It, uh, it's basically free, you know? And so, uh, somebody sent one Satoshi on the Tron network. So the Tron network has these wrapped coins, wrapped BTC, wrapped ETH, I think wrapped Litecoin's coming. Uh, I'd like to see wrapped BNB. But the beautiful thing about those those coins is they ride on the Tron network. Hello. And uh, on the Tron network, they're fast and free, man. There's none of that congestion. There's none of that high gas fees. It's all good. And, uh, but they're wrapped, which that just means it's a placeholder, right? Like a Bitcoin on the Tron network technically isn't Bitcoin. It's Tron. Or it's, you know, a, it's a, it's a, it's mechanism is basically Tron. But, um, but they take, uh, 
a coin and they put it in custody and then they issue you the equal value and then when you want to roll it back out you get your Bitcoin back so if you wrap your Bitcoin and it goes up to a million dollars when you pull it out you basically get that out you get your million dollar Bitcoin back out so pretty cool concept because when it enters the Tron network like I said it's fast and free man so somebody sent one Satoshi okay so I know everybody knows what a Satoshi is but a Bitcoin, really Bitcoin, like I don't even know why we talked about Bitcoin. Really what he created was a Satoshi. And that's 100th million of a Bitcoin. Like that is the one cent to the US dollar. But, but there's 100 million in there. And uh, so you can just do the numbers, you know. If a Satoshi would ever equal a dollar, you'd, a Bitcoin would be $100 million. And I predict that soon enough, no one is ever going to talk about the price action of Bitcoin anymore. And we're going to start talking about the price action of a Satoshi. It'll probably happen about the time a Satoshi hits one cent. And then it'll just, that's what everybody will talk about. That's, you'll see that go across the screen on CNBC, the price of a Satoshi. And people will be like, yeah, I got 10,000 Satoshis. And they'll get rich off of it. They'll get rich because they had 10,000 Satoshis. Right, so those of you with Bitcoin understand that that the fortunes are going to be made off Satoshi's in that price action, which means your Bitcoin is going to be worth ridiculous amounts of money, but maybe not in our lifetime. Ooh, I know that's not a popular opinion. I know that everybody wants it to be this year. Hell, I want it to be this year. I'm a, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I got Bitcoin. I believe in Bitcoin. I believe in in uh, be being your own bank. I believe in the empowerment of Bitcoin and what it can do to the lowest denominator of our economies. You start giving, you know, poor people banking ability, and you can stake it, and you can earn off of it. That's the kind of power that uh, empires are built from. And if you don't believe me, read up on your British history and, uh, and the power of banking. So, uh, you know, I believe that what we're doing here in the U.S. government and in other nations around the country, around the world, is uh, probably going to be beneficial to Bitcoin. Now, there's some people who think that, you know, we're going to see huge numbers fast. I don't know how fast. I hope real fast, but I understand the mechanism. I'll just tell you that. I get the mechanism. And the mechanism is um, other currencies can be manipulated. It can be deflated and inflated. And money supply is controlled. And Bitcoin, it's already out there, man. It's been out there for like 12 years now. And you can't make more and you can't take any well, oh, well, here's another thing about Bitcoin that's very interesting. Um, I say that you can't destroy Bitcoin, but actually you can, because there's probably half the Bitcoin that's been minted, that's been out there, is forever lost and locked away in uh, wallets that will never see the light of day again. No one has the keys to it. No, there's some of them probably people didn't even know existed. Some of the wallets were created and filled in the early days of Bitcoin and lost, and nobody knows anything about them. There's probably families out there that actually, by all rights, have access to millions of dollars and don't know it. And then there's the people that have millions of dollars and know it but can't access it. And they think it's roughly half the Bitcoin out there. So, like 9 million Bitcoin lost and not coming back. So, you take that 21 million figure and you, you divide it in half, and really we're talking about about 10 million Bitcoin, right? Wait till that sinks in. And guess what? It's my theory that we have less Bitcoin available every day because somebody dies without telling somebody else how to access their Bitcoin. And I think that that happens every day. Hello. And uh, and so 
That's less Bitcoin every day, man. So you take something that can't be inflated, or you know, you can't manipulate it. And I know people say that the price has been manipulated with tether, and you know the amount of tether that's been minted whenever it slopes off, Bitcoin slopes off. And there's some intricacies there, but I tell you what, let me just tell you one thing. This whole thing about Tether and whether, you know, Tether has, you know, what, $15 billion out there and it's supposed to all be in a bank account, but it's really not. There's plenty of U.S. dollars in the bank account, but some of it's been used to buy Bitcoin, so it's kind of like being propped up by Bitcoin, which has been a good play. But what if Bitcoin goes back down to $500 and may not be that good of a play then so there's a lot of intricacies there but here's the way I look at it I've used tether to buy Bitcoin okay I've I've procured tether and then we we'll use it to buy Bitcoin but after I buy the Bitcoin I give the tether back so what does it matter if tether goes away it shouldn't really affect the price of my Bitcoin that's what I think I mean tell me if I'm wrong but that's that's the way I look at it However, the cryptocurrency world is full of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it's uh, about market sentiment. You know, the market sentiment affects stocks quite a bit, but it really affects cryptocurrency, how people feel about things. So, so you know, that's some possible roadblocks to Bitcoin doing well is whatever happens with this Tether thing. and. You know, the SEC wants to regulate, but I, I don't understand how the SEC is going to regulate Bitcoin. One thing is, already been out there for a long time. Most of the nodes are outside of the United States. And as long as everything's connected over the Internet, other than telling me, you can't send your Bitcoin anywhere. Other than telling me that, they can't stop it. Uh, there's people that think that Elon Musk has Bitcoin nodes, mining rigs, up on those Starlink satellites and this entire planet could go up in a storm and the interplanetary internet that he's building so that he can talk to his Mars base um, has Bitcoin mining rigs which means you can conduct Bitcoin commerce so I don't know how they're going to regulate that how are you going to regulate that somebody tell me please other than just telling you, no, you can't do that. So, I think that's pretty interesting. You know, about Bitcoin and uh, how many coins are, are lost, not coming back. Every day, I think somebody loses a Bitcoin or some Satoshis. And so, for that reason, I tell everybody that will listen to me buy one Bitcoin. I didn't say buy one Bitcoin and swing trade it. I didn't say buy one Bitcoin and become a day trader. I said just buy one Bitcoin and put it away. Now I realize Bitcoin's trading for $37,000 right now. And not everybody can pull $37,000 out of a hat and buy a Bitcoin. But I'm going to tell you this. If you can, do it. And if you can't, buy what you can Start stacking Satoshis. Stop thinking Bitcoin. Start stacking Satoshis. Okay? It's your chance. We're still early enough. We're still early enough. Okay, everybody. I'm going to call this ride over.